اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ وحدہ وصلاۃ وسلام علام اللہ نبی بعد اما بعد Inshallah ta'ala this evening we will continue in our series of lessons in the book Shama'il al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or the characteristics of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam by al-Imam Abu Isa al-Tirmidhi rahimahullah <coughs> So we've reached to chapter number 19 where Imam, al-Imam al-Tirmidhi rahimahullah he says Bab ما جاء في مشية رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم The chapter of what has been reported about how the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه, <coughs> صلى الله عليه وسلم used to walk uh, And so the walking of the messenger عليه الصلاة والسلام was, as, was with everything the, the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام he took Uh, a middle course as Allah Azza wa Jal, He has commanded وَقْصُدْ فِي مَشْيِكَ and be middle grounded and you're walking and you don't walk lazily and you don't walk uh, as a person in haste but rather it should be in between and so the uh, the first hadith that Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi Rahimahullah he brings He says that we were told by Qutayba ibn Sa'id who said that we were told by Ibn Lahia on the authority of Abu Yunus on the authority of Abu Huraira radiyallahu ta'ala anhu who said wala ra'aytu shay'an ahsana min rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ka anna ash-shamsa tajri fi wajhihi wa ma ra'aytu ahadan asra'a fi mashyatihi min rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam كأنما الأرض تطوى له إن لا نجهد أنفسنا وإنه لا غير مكتثر. أبو هريرة رضي الله تعالى عنه he said that I've never seen anything more uh, beautiful than of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم. It was as if the sun was uh, <coughs> was shining uh, in his face. Uh, and I haven't seen anyone that was quicker in his walking than the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was as if the earth was, was laid out uh, for him. We are troubling ourselves or we're struggling with ourselves and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was taking it easy. So me here, this hadith, the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he shows us uh, about the beautifulness Uh, the handsomeness and the brightness that was with the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. That just by looking at him uh, in his face, there was a type of brightness uh, that, <clears throat> that you can be seen from the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And he alayhi salatu wasalam was someone that when he walked, he walked with purpose. I don't, do you remember when we talked about that? Uh, towards the beginning uh, of the book in some of the first chapters we talked about or we, we mentioned uh, briefly how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he walked he walked with purpose he was not an individual that walked lazily like how we see today people they're walking or they, we call it strutting they kind of strut where it's almost as if they have nowhere to go and nothing to do and so they walk as though They just, you know, they're bored uh, and they just have nothing to do with their time. And so they're lazy to the point where they don't even pick up their feet when they walk. Because they kind of just walk and kind of like drag the heels on the ground. Whereas the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam walked, when he walked, he walked with purpose. To the point where <coughs> the Sahaba who were younger than him. Many of the Sahaba were, 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 were much younger than him. And he would walk to a point in a way that they themselves couldn't even really... Uh, well, they kept up with him, but it took, uh, it took some effort uh, on their part uh, in order to be able to keep up with them. So, uh, so this shows us that 
the Prophet ﷺ, when he walked, he walked uh, with purpose, going from one place to the other. Because he was not someone who just didn't have anything to do. He had plenty to do. The Prophet ﷺ, he wore many hats. Meaning he had many different types of responsibilities. So for example, he was the Imam of the Masjid. He was the Imam of the Masjid. That's my, I'll give, that's my, that's my answer. Who can tell me uh, one of the other hats that the Prophet wasallam he wore? Or one of the other uh, responsibilities that he had, alayhi salatu wasalam? He was a father. The Prophet wasallam was a father. Very good. He was a father. Right, he was a judge. He was the one responsible for passing judgment in the affairs of the people. Uh. He was a husband. The Prophet ﷺ was a husband. He had many wives. What else? Right, he was the, he was the leader. He was the leader of the army. He was the general and the leader of the army. Anything else? Huh? He was a teacher, right? He was responsible for the te- he was responsible for teaching the people. Well, which is now, huh? Well, he he was the imam of the masjid, but more importantly, even after all of this, he was also wali al amr. He was the wali al amr. He was the head of state. He was responsible. He was not just the leader of the army and the imam of the masjid, but he was also responsible for the state of <coughs> al Medina. He was responsible for that. So the Prophet wasallam had many, many responsibilities. And so he didn't have the luxury of what some people have today, just to be able to strut around and walk around as if you know, they have nothing to do. The Prophet wasallam when he was walking, I mean, he was walking somewhere, going towards something to take care of something that he was responsible for. As the Prophet والسلام, did not waste uh, any time. And the amazing thing is that the Prophet والسلام, with all of his responsibilities, he was able to accomplish every single one of his responsibilities and no one complained that the Prophet ﷺ was falling short in anything that he was responsible for. His wives didn't complain that he wasn't being a good enough husband. His children didn't complain that he wasn't being a good enough father. His grandchildren weren't complaining saying he's not a good grandfather. The community wasn't complaining saying, you know, he's not a good imam. He's not doing good enough in the khutbah. He's not here for us to solve our problems. Uh, and so no one complained about the Prophet wasallam, which means that he fulfilled all of these different responsibilities. Every single thing he was responsible for, he was fulfilling uh, those responsibilities to the fullest. And part of, a part of that, part of being able to accomplish things on that level is when he was walking from one place to the next, that he wasn't being lazy when walking to that place or heading towards towards handling his responsibilities. Uh, But rather he walked, and he walked with uh, a purpose. (coughs) Uh, The next hadith, uh, Al-Imam At-Tirmidhi rahimahullah, he says, we were told by Ali ibn Hujur and also others, they said, we were told by Isa ibn Yunus, on the authority of Umar ibn Abdullah, Mawla, uh, Mawla Ghufra, who said that I, we, I was informed by Ibrahim ibn Muhammad from the children of Ali ibn Abi anhu, who said that Ali, إِذَا وَصَفَ النَّبِيَّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ قَالَ كَانَ إِذَا مَشَى تَقَلَّعَ كَأَنَّمَا يَنْحَطُّ مِنْ صَدَبْ مِنْ صَبَبْ Ali, رضي الله تعالى عنه, uh, he, when he would describe the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said he would say that when he walked, he would walk briskly. He would walk 
briskly and he would be leaning forward. He would be leaning forward as though he's going, going down on a decline. And so when, you, when you're walking down, let's say you're walking down a mountain, right, or walking down a slope, then you kind of lean forward and you move faster. And so the Prophet ﷺ, when he walked, he walked very quickly and he would lean forward when he was walking and this would help push uh, his momentum. Um, when I was in high school, uh, I used to run track. When I was in high school, I used to run track. And one of the techniques that our coaches used to teach us is when you run, don't run standing, don't run with your body straight up in the air, and don't lean back, but lean forward. When you're running, lean forward. Why? Because every, when you take a step leaning forward, the step is going to, uh, you're able to, your, your foot is able to go further out than ver versus if you were just uh, running, standing straight up. And so maybe you can go home, you can try this yourself. You know, you stand straight up, stick your, you know, lift your leg up and put your, try to put your foot out without leaning forward. Try to put your foot out while standing straight up as far as you can and then put a mark and see where that is. Now then lean forward and do the same thing and you'll notice that when you're leaning forward, your foot is able to go further than if you were just standing straight up. And so with that you can cover more ground using the same amount of energy, right? So if you're lean forward, you don't have to pick up the pace and use more energy to go faster. And so that was the concept. And so the Prophet wasallam, when he walked, he leaned forward a little bit. And that was and without having to utilize any more energy and to go faster, he could actually go faster just by leaning forward. <coughs> and the Prophet ﷺ uh, used to walk uh, very uh, briskly. And then the last narration that Al Imam al Tirmidhi rahimahullah he mentions, uh, he says, We were told by Sufyan ibn Waqi' uh, who said that we were told by my father on the authority of Al Mas'udi, on the authority of Uthman ibn Muslim, ibn Hurmuz. On the authority of Nafi ibn Jubair ibn Mut'im, on the authority of Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, qala kana nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam idha masha takaffa'a takaffu'an ka'annama yinhattu min sadab. Ali, he said, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he walked, he leaned forward uh, and as though he was on a decline. As though he was on a decline. So the next chapter, chapter 20, <coughs> Al Imam al Tirmidhi rahimahullah he says, Bab ma jaa fi taqannu'i Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al taqannu' is taking a, uh, like a piece of cloth and placing it over your head. Taking a piece of cloth and placing it over your head. Usually, at that time, uh, the people who did that, they did that usually because they had oils uh, in their hair. They had oil in their hair. Uh, they had oil in their hair and they would wrap uh, their head in order to uh, keep the, uh, the oil uh, in the hair and to protect the, the head and to let the oil uh, take, it, take root inside of the head on the, on the scalp along with uh, the hair. So this is taqannu'. And so Imam al-Tirmidhi rahimahullah, he says, Bab ma jaa fi taqannu'i Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The chapter what has been reported about the taqannu' of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. <coughs> and he brings one hadith uh, in this chapter, wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. He brings one hadith in this chapter, he says, we were told by Yusuf ibn Isa, who said that we were told by Waqi'ah, who said that we were told by Al Rabi' ibn Sabih, on the authority of Yazid ibn Abban, on the authority of Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who said, Can Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yukthiru al qina' ka anna thawbahu thawbu zayyat? Anas 
radiallahu anhu saying that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to uh, cover his head uh, a lot and his thobe, it was as if he was the thobe of the man who sells oil. Uh, this hadith is da'if. This hadith is uh, da'if and it is not authentic. Uh, and so the, the, if, it was, if it was authentic, it would show that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on a regular basis used to cover uh, his head in the style of taqannu'. However, um, the only thing that I found that is authentic in, in this respect uh, is what was reported by Imam al-Bukhari, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, in the <coughs> where one of the sahaba, uh, they were sitting and they saw the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, going by and he was, he was, his head was covered uh, and it was said to Abu Bakr, Hadha Rasulullah mutaqanni'a. Uh, they said, that, that, here goes the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and his head was covered. Uh, however, Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim, Rahimullah, he said in Zad Al-Ma'ad, that the reason why the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was covering his head in this instant was because uh, he was hiding and he was walking in a way that he didn't want to be seen. He was hiding in a way that he didn't want, he was walking in a way that he did not want to be seen. And so this shows us that the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, he only uh, practiced the taqannu' during times where it was needed. Not, it was not something that he did on a regular basis. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The next chapter, chapter 21, <coughs> Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi rahimahullah, he says, Bab, the chapter of what has been reported about how the Messenger وسلم, used to sit. And he brings uh, a couple of uh, hadith uh, in this chapter. The first hadith uh, that he brings, he says, We were told by Abd ibn Humayd, who said that we were told by Affan ibn Muslim, who said that we were told by Abdullah ibn Hassan on the authority of my. Uh, uh, my grandmother on the authority of Qayla binti uh, Makhrama radiallahu ta'ala anha who she said uh, that she saw the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fil masjid wa huwa qa'idun al-furfusa qalat falamma ra'aytu rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-mutakhashi' fil jissati ur'idtu min al-faraq she she says Qayla uh, ibn to Makhrama radiallahu ta'ala anha she said that she saw the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sitting in a position of al-qurfusa uh, so uh, this is one of two ways this is done in one of two ways and I'm going to have to show it because explaining it is a little bit difficult so um the sitting is like this. Oh. Like this. A person sits like this, where he he sits with his, his knees into his stomach and he wraps his arms around his knees like this. The second way, the second understanding is it is possibly for a person to sit with his with his legs on the ground, right, while he has his hands underneath of his armpits and his stomach is tucked into his, like this. So that's, so it's, those are the two ways of sitting, the sitting of Al-Qurfusa. Uh, <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best as to which of those two in particular were uh, intended uh, by this. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to sit. Now the first method that I showed, we call this an ihtiba. We call it ihtiba. Have you ever heard this term before? Al ihtiba? Well this is you know that sitting of al ihtiba is that's the description of it. When a person sits on his uh, on his backside and he pulls his knees into his chest and he wraps his arms 
Yeah, just like this. This is called al ihtiba And the Prophet wasallam actually prohibited this uh, 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 if, if the man, if the person is sitting fi thawbin wahid. إِذَا كَانَ لَابِسًا ثَوْبًا وَاحِدًا فَهُوَ مَنْهِيٌ عَنْهُ Because if a person is wearing a single thawb, then it's, 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 it's been prohibited to sit like this because if you're only wearing just one thawb, then sitting in this manner will allow for other people to be able to see uh, your aura and your aura will become uh, exposed. So this position uh, has actually been prohibited by the Prophet ﷺ in the case where an individual is wearing only one thobe. Also, there's some ahadith where this, this, this sitting was, was, uh, it was reported that the Prophet ﷺ prohibited this type of sitting uh, during khutbah al Jumu'ah. Uh, however, I don't know uh, to the extent of how uh, that these, these, these ahadith are authentic. I believe that it's, there's, a there's a strong possibility that these narrations uh, are weak. Uh, on top of the fact that some of the Sahaba, like Ibn Umar and others, uh, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri and others, they used to uh, permit the people to sit uh, in the ihtiba during uh, the Jumu'ah while the Imam was delivering uh, the khutbah. So, and then, so she, uh, uh, she goes on to say that when she saw the Prophet ﷺ like this, then she became, uh, she was overwhelmed with fear uh, <coughs> because when she, when she saw that the, this, was a, this was a sitting, uh, the Prophet ﷺ was not sitting in a, in a position of uzma, in a position of, uh, of status. Like if you were to walk in into uh, a king's uh, if you were to go into his chamber, then he'd be sitting on a huge throne, sitting in a manner that's uh, 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 where he's, you know, you can see that he's somebody important. Even if you didn't know who he was, you can tell that just the, his sitting posture and the sitting place that he's somebody that's, you know, of high status and he's somebody that has, you know, great position. But the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and as we know, the ground of the, of, of the masjid was dirt. The ground of the masjid was dirt. And we find the Prophet وسلم, sitting in a way that is very, very uh, humble. And so she says, when I saw him like this, وسلم, I became fearful. Uh, and Allah knows best uh, you know, the specific reasons. However, a person uh, may see themselves, when they see someone like uh, the Prophet وسلم, sitting in a, in a position that's humble, then maybe they see in themselves, if he's that humble, then why am I not as humble as that? You know, the Prophet وسلم, being as humble as he is, and he has a right to, if he, you know, he, if someone was going to be arrogant, if someone was going to you know, stick his nose in the air, if someone was going to see himself as being better than others, then who would be have that right more than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But yet, he sat in a sitting, in a position that was humble. And so it makes a person, seeing him like this, makes a person say to himself and think about themselves and uh, analyze how uh, their, own, uh, their own humbleness and it makes a person become fearful. Uh, the next hadith Al Imam al Tirmidhi, rahimahullah, he says, We were told by Sa'id ibn Abdul Rahman al Makhzumi, uh, also we were told by others as well. They all said that we were told by Sufyan on the authority of Az Zuhri, on the authority of Abbad ibn Tamim, on the authority of his uncle, that he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mustalqiyan fil masjid, wadi'an ihda rijlayhi ala al ukhra. Uh, the uncle of Abbad ibn Tamim, عنه, he said, I saw the Messenger uh, lying down and istilqa is when a person, he lies on his back, right? He lies on his back and his, uh, and he may even have maybe like, it's possible that he may, he may have a pillow or something or he may put his hands behind his neck, but he's laying on his back, laying on with his head resting when his body is facing 
upwards. And so that's, this is called al-istilqa. Uh, and so he said that he saw the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mustalqiyan in the masjid, in the masjid, which also necessitates that his legs were pointed straight out. They were pointed straight out. Wadi'an ihda rujlehi al ukhra that he had one leg placed over the other. He had one leg placed. Just like this, right? Just like that. Go ahead, show the show. Yeah, just like this. And his leg stretched out with one leg placed over the other. To show, and this was inside of the masjid. This was inside of the masjid. And someone has saw the Prophet ﷺ doing this to show that this type of sitting is permissible. However, however, uh, we need to, if someone is going to lay like this, then a person does need to recognize that this sitting or this type of laying down, uh, if you're close to other people, it may be offensive. It may be offensive. Uh, <coughs> and so I know that in some cultures, if you were to point your feet at someone in their direction, they're going to be really angry because it's a sign of uh, disrespect. And so we need to pay attention to that. Uh, we don't want to uh, claim that we're practicing a sunnah while at the same time we are causing problems and offending people and making individuals mad. Especially in light of the fact that we have no evidence to prove that there is a specific reward for laying in this manner. There's no, the Prophet wasallam never commanded anyone nor did he say whoever lays in this fashion that he shall have X reward or he's going to have this in Jannah. There's no encouragement from the Prophet ﷺ to do this. And so we say that it's permissible. No one's going to deny that it's permissible. However, if you lay like this in a, in a, in a setting where it's going to uh, offend people, then uh, harming and offending the Muslims is not permissible. It is not permissible to harm or offend the Muslims. And so practicing something that is, even if we were to say that this is recommended, even if that was the case, we do not place something that is muharram uh, before, or we don't place something that is recommended before something that is uh, haram. And so we, we would leave alone and stay away from something, even if it was recommended, if it's going to mean that we're going to fall into that which is haram. Like, for example, the touching of, or the kissing of the black stone. There's a virtue in that. And this is sunnah. This is sunnah. As we have reports from the Prophet, والسلام, encouraging us uh, to do this. However, if doing, if kissing or touching the black stone at the Kaaba is going to mean that you have to push an old lady into the floor and she's going to drop her baby. On, and, and he, or an old gentleman is going to fall and hit his head or you're going to squish somebody and, 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 and elbow them in the ribs or break somebody's tooth if this is what it's going to mean then we need to stay away from that because those actions are not permissible and, it's not, it, is, and it is not wise or it is not permissible for us to try to accomplish something that is recommended through practicing something that is haram does that make sense? Abdullah, you, you understand that? All right, very good. So, uh, the, <coughs> uh, the last hadith here in this chapter, Al-Imam At-Tirmidhi rahimahullah, he says, we were told by Salama ibn, Sh uh, ibn uh, Shabib, on the, he says, we were told by Abdullah ibn Ibrahim al-Madani, who said that we were told by Ishaq ibn Muhammad al-Ansari, on the authority of Rubayh ibn Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Sa'id, on the authority of his father, on the authority of his grandfather, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, who said, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا جلس في المسجد احتبى بيديه. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, he said that when the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, if he sat in the masjid, he was sat uh, in the position of al-ihtiba, which is the, the first position that we talked about, where a person, uh, when he's sitting on his rear end, his knees into uh, his chest and he wraps his arms uh, around his legs. 
And so the Prophet ﷺ, when he sat in the masjid, and he would sit in this uh, position. However, uh, that this was in the case where he was wearing more than one item of clothing. And we said before, just a few minutes ago, that if a person is sitting in a way that's going to expose uh, his aura, then it's not permissible for him to sit uh, in this fashion. Uh, so inshallah ta'ala, we will stop. Uh, we're going to stop here, and the next week we'll pick up with chapter 22, inshallah ta'ala. If anybody has any questions, uh, then we'll answer them now, inshallah. Tfadal. Fikum barak, inshallah. ال ال نعم جائز إن شاء الله إنه تحته تحته السروال تحته السروال يعني ال يعني في ذاك الوقت يخرج الشخص من بيته وما يلبس إلا الثوب هذا على جسده على جسده ما إلا إلا هذا الثوب يعني ما بداخله شيء نعم ناس they were people were very very poor they had. They were very, very poor, and so uh, they didn't have. They didn't have the luxuries like we do, where we put on a, you know, put on one layer, then put on a different layer, and then put on a third layer. Matter of fact, let me, let me spice it up a little bit with a fourth layer. Uh, only, you know, rich people dress like that. You know, with them, they would put on one thobe and go out and take care of their business, uh, go to the masjid. This is one of the reasons why. The Prophet ﷺ ordered the women, and when they were in the masjid for the salat, when they come up from sujood, the women were ordered to, uh, to, to hold off for just a slight moment. That give Because some of the men, they didn't have enough uh, clothing to really even cover themselves properly. And so when the women would come up, you would, and if they came up too quickly, you could actually see uh, the aura of the man because he didn't have anything else. Uh, to cover himself with. Um, so the women were told to, when, the, when they're coming up from the sujood, that they should hold off uh, for just slight, a slight moment to give the men time to be able to come up and go into the sitting uh, position. <coughs> and sh- they, had, they were poor. There were poor people who lived at that time. And, 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 and some of the famous companions we know uh, were poor. You know, there was a time when Ibn Umar, radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, he said, I didn't have any place to stay except in the masjid. Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, lived in the masjid. And there were many others who are from Ahl Sufa, the people who actually, their home was in the masjid. Uh, there were people who, uh, they didn't eat very often. There were people who, they didn't have many clothes uh, to cover them. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us uh, and give us guidance. But they, uh, their, their poverty... Uh, was not held against them as some of the most uh, famous people to ever live. Also, uh, the hadith is a hadith in Sahih Muslim where the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said that a person who had the worst life in this dunya, he had the worst life, I mean, he had all the calamities and his life was the hardest, he will <coughs> be taken and he'll be dipped in Jannah and brought out. Just dipped. Dip in, brought out. And then Allah will ask him, have you ever seen any hardships in your life? He's going to say, Wallahi, my Lord, I've never seen any hardships ever. Just being dipped in Jannah is going to, he's not even going to remember all the hardships that, uh, that he went to, that he went through. So you have people like Abu Huraira, people <coughs> and others from the Sahaba who were poor, and were hungry, and they struggled, they didn't have shoes, they didn't have clothes, but what they did have was iman. And they had religion, and they had worship, they had tawheed, and they were companions of the Prophet wasallam. And so when these individuals who sacrificed their lives for the sake of Allah, 
when they entered into Jannah, all that's not going to matter. They're not even going to remember any of the hardships. That one person that had the hardest life dipped in Jannah and brought out just a dip. That's, that's the bliss of Jannah. And that's how, how much it has an effect on people that just be dipped in and brought out and makes you forget every hardship. Uh, so, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from the people of Jannah. Anybody have anything else? Tafadha, Shah. Fikam Barak, Shah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يقول فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ Allah says, so fear Allah to the best of your ability. So when a person is in the maqaf and there's izdiham and it's really, you know, especially like on, uh, on the 10th, on the 10th of the hijjah uh, you're going to find that it, the, the maqaf is, is extremely crowded, right? <coughs> My advice is for the people to, uh, maybe you can, get move, you can remove yourself from all of that by going all the way up to the third floor. And usually even on that day, uh, where there's millions of people there, the third floor is, is less crowded and you don't have, you have elbow room. You can even do like this. The only problem with that is it's going to take you a long time to make tawaf on, on the roof. Uh, but if, you're going to, if, you, if you have to be downstairs and you can't find your way upstairs or you want to get lost or something like this, then the, person, the best thing for the person to do is to keep his hands uh, to himself. And when the crowd starts to push, then he just kind of you know, flows, with, flows with the crowd, keep his legs moving so he doesn't fall. And beware not to be in the, in the you know, when other people start pushing, not to be from amongst those uh, who are pushing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Uh, I believe that there, you know, with the expansion of the masjid, uh, that things inshallah ta'ala will, uh, with that will get a little easier. Uh, they removed, a while ago, they removed the stairs that uh, led down to the well of Zamzam. Because there used to be, uh, I don't know if any of you actually been to Mecca before. Uh, there used to be a, a stair, like a section. You go downstairs, you can actually see, in a big window, you can actually see uh, the mechanisms that they have built to, to pull the water out of, uh, out of the well. And you went downstairs to drink Zamzam. Now they close that off, and so it's just, and it's it's like an oval almost. And they're trying to, you can see that they're trying to make it more circular to make it easier for uh, the people to continually move around uh, in a circle. It's just, you know, they're trying to stop the buildup at the uh, at the black stone, which kind of causes uh, some of the congestion. <coughs> But if a person, uh, if, he's, if he's trying to, uh, he, can, he can make his way around the Kaaba, close to the Kaaba, and never push anybody. That's if he's patient and he waits for his moments to be able to, when there's sometimes as you're going and you're making tawaf, there are spaces that open up and you can kind of dip your shoulder in and kind of move in closer and then just keep and be patient and then... Because uh, there's always somebody pushing and shoving, trying to get out, and they push and they shove and they're rude. Uh, and so sometimes the crowd opens up because somebody pushes somebody. So the crowd opens up and there's a space. You can dip your shoulder in and get a little closer. You know, and that happens all the way around. And by the time you go around once or twice, now you're actually uh, close uh, to the Kaaba. However, however, uh, it's always, you know, the, the black stone is always muzdahim. It's always izdiham uh, at that particular spot. Uh, and so uh, a person, um, it, it's going to be difficult for him to you know, get in there without you know, getting involved in, in the pushing. Uh, he has to be very patient because you know, the closer you get, then the other people will push you. Uh, and sometimes they'll push you on purpose. They'll push you on purpose. They'll grab you, move you out the way to get in front of you. And... You know, 
And you have to be very, very patient with the people uh, because sometimes people come from places where that's not really rude. It's, it's hard to imagine that, right? It's hard to imagine that. But some people come from places where them getting in front of you forcefully is culturally acceptable. Like that's, that's okay. You can do that. Uh, and so some of the people around the world come from these places. And so they practice this uh, while you are, uh, while you're there. So you have to be patient. You have to be patient. You have to be, uh, uh, you have to be easygoing. You have to be forgiving and you can't allow, you know, all these little things, you know, any little things to, uh, you know, to set you off. Like we talked about on Friday night uh, from the characteristics of good manners is an uh, awful, is uh, pardoning and overlooking uh, and being forbearing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us. Um, uh, Can't really see somebody have wrote something. I'm sorry. Inshallah ta'ala. We'll look at the, the comments and the, if there are any questions on, on the on the Facebook uh, comments, we'll, we'll answer them after we finish the live feed. because uh, I can't really uh, I can't see uh, what is the what is the I'm sorry, I can't see it. I'm, I'm, so inshallah when we turn off the live feed, we'll We'll look it up, inshallah ta'ala, and we will answer uh, the question if we have the ability, inshallah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hadha wallahu ta'ala a'la wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Rashid, is there any way to make this like, uh, like to blow this up and make this like a little bigger? Or do we just have to get like a bigger? All you have to do is cut it. And... There's a way to make the, there's a way to make it bigger? Oh, we can do that? Yeah. Oh, we have to, I'll, I'll play with it, inshallah. هذا والله تعالى أعلم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد